Hi, all. I'm Dan Smegbride, founder of the We Get Around Network Forum, WGANforum.com. Today is Wednesday, April 28th, 2021, and you're watching WGAN-TV Live at 5. We have an awesome show for you today, Imagining the Future for 3D Tour Technology for Real Estate Photographers. And here to visit with us on this topic is Dr. Kelly Kors Anderson, researcher at Texas Tech University and incoming assistant professor of marketing at College of Charleston, effective August 2021. Kelly, good to see you again. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you again, Dan, for the invitation and to the larger WGAN community for your continued support in my research. I really am elated to be back and share a little bit today about some of what I've been working on. Awesome. We're, we're happy to have you back. I know our previous show, Virtual Tour Superheroes at Your Service, that was really just an awesome show to be focused in on uh, photographers, service providers, real estate photographers. And I know that you're often quoted by Matterport because you've done a ton of research related to uh, real estate listings uh, that feature virtual tours selling faster and at a higher selling price. So you really are the, like our researcher sub subject matter expert uh, in this space on this topic. Kelly, before I ask you the question, what is the future of 3D tour technology for real estate photographers? Give us the backstory, the context for why that's such a great question to ask you. Yeah, that's, that's great. So, you know, a lot of my research, as you mentioned, has been centered in this community. I, I come, of course, with baggage. Before starting my doctoral program, I spent 15 years in industry, researching markets, researching predominantly consumers in retail, um, but was always fixated and fascinated with media and new technology and how that was changing the way um, consumption was happening. And so I came into my program curious specifically around this type of technology that all of you work on. Um, and that has really been the, the burner for my, my entire research stream for the last four years. Um, from the Matterport statistics you mentioned up to the su superhero service providers uh, piece that we've been working on, I've worked on a number of different items. Um, not just in real estate, but in the general market area of this technology as well. And so this project in general that I was going to share a little bit with you today uh, naturally emerged from some of this early dissertation and related work. Um, I became very curious about the development of this as a media technology market. Uh, when I really, I continued to hear from you all, from photographers like you, about those imaginative ways that you were using the technology. And this was blowing my mind as far as, wait a second, how, what's happening here? What is What are those underlying mechanisms? Uh, so interestingly enough, um, no one in mac marketing academia had really unpacked this and tried to understand specifically how uh, customers and those end consumers actually drove the development of a media technology market which is kind of surprising when we think of how many media technology markets there have been over the years. Things like radio has continued to grow. Television is being used in different ways or than originally perceived. Um, even Facebook's different social media. So this ended up being um, just a nice compliment to better understand. And also what I was seeing through this imaginative uses is there was an underlying mechanism that we didn't really understand from a marketing perspective that's driving the market. So I'll share a little bit more about that, but my dissertation research started with understanding the real estate market, how all of the individuals that work together co-create what you would consider value and different forms of value. So things that you expect to things that you don't expect that emerge coming from this co-creation with this type of technology, with the 3D tours. Um, and then revealed this other underlying mechanism that showed that 
hey, the market's growing in dynamic ways. What is happening here? So the whole second portion of my dissertation work has concentrated on this. Um, the approach is qualitative, of course, uh, as much of my work, as you know, has really centered in some of that. Uh, the approach I take here is called socio-historical research. So it was really important when studying markets to really go very deep in understanding how the market progressed. So this includes not only the interactions and the conversations that happen between those social players, people such as the developers of the technology to the firm employees, to even the photographers like yourselves, uh, but also those macro influences. Um, the, really the institutions that we live and we work in that shape the way that we interact with technology today. So in total, long-winded um, conversation here, but in total, I interviewed 33 firm employees and their customers of a leading technology firm. Eight, I scraped eight years, over eight years of that prominent developer's website. Um, I looked at and coded over 4,000 pages of press articles, marketing materials, case studies, et cetera, that really discussed this technology and how it was conceived and perceived of over time. Also, as well as the posts and the responses, thank you to the WGA and community, um, as well as a significant amount of reading of historical texts to really understand the Silicon Valley, its roots, and the culture that really has bubbled up in, in the Silicon Valley in general. So you really are the right person to ask this question. Yes. What is the future of 3D tour technology for real estate photographers? I hope so. <laughs> it's been a it's been a fun journey. Um, the kind of key findings that came out of this, um, certainly. Of course, as I sort of nodded to earlier, imagination as being a huge driving force in media technology development. You know, how that market actually expands, not only how it's developed, but how that expansion happens. Well, we'll, we'll, talk, about, we'll talk about some of your, how you got to your conclusions, but let, let's start maybe with some of the highlights of the conclusions of, of what your research showed in terms of what is the future of 3D tour technology there, specifically for real estate photographers. And then maybe we'll drill down about, well, why is that the case? How did you get there? That's fair. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, as far as when we're thinking about the future, when you are a, a 3D tour, 360 tour photographer within this space, there, there are a few things I want us to keep in mind. Um, you know, first of all, think wide. We need to think wide when we're thinking about how to position your businesses. So what other industries are possible in using this technology? That creation of diversity in your portfolios, of course, helps in really trying to maintain your business during tough times, as many of you felt over the last year even. Um, and online forums, of course, as I've, I've mentioned in previous conversations, like the WGAN is a great resource for that. Um, it offers a place where you can discuss and have conversations about this, um, but also co-creating this new market and this and as an innovation. But it's also important for us to go deep. And this is where probably we'll, we'll spend more of our time today, but we need to consider who this technology impacts. So one of the suggestions I make is be mindful, even proactive in gaining those end consumers understanding and approval of utilizing this technology. The underlying data, which many of us are aware of, underlying the content that we capture has great power potential. But as we know, power is not always good and not always bad. It usually comes together. It's all together in the same. So that those are two major takeaways I want to make sure that we have. There's a lot of opportunity for this market, right? So we see that there's a number of positives. Now, I, I don't 
I don't consider myself a futurist, just to make that clear. Um, but there are a few pathways uh, for this type of technology, especially technology that has that underlying artificial intelligence, that AI that really helps to encapsulate those data derivatives. Um, and this is really, so the suggestions that I have that I'll share with you uh, where I think the future of this is going is informed from one, an interestingly uh, interesting alignment that comes from people talking about this market right now, but also understanding that larger social structure uh, that, that constrains our market, right? That can, will constrain where we're probably headed. Well, many in our community that we get around network forum are real estate photographers. So mm -hmm. do they, do they, do we stay in residential real estate, commercial real estate, drill down deep in terms of our expertise in that subject matter area, or do we start moving into other verticals? And if so, why? Right. I would suggest there's a lot of opportunity to going wide. You know, there's, of course, benefit to staying narrow and becoming experts, and that, that has been seen. But I think what we, we can see in this technology is there is a ton of opportunity for enhancing our legitimacy, the legitimacy for this technology, if you're utilizing it in more than just one industry. Um, looking at the different verticals provides additional support and growth for this market, but it also helps to create, as I mentioned, that diversity, you know, creates a good portfolio um, and understanding where you can go. I mean, we've seen different examples from um, utilizing this technology. Of course, in real estate is a foundation. It's grown. It's been supported, um, you know, by the, the key firms that have really grown this market. Uh, and that support is important. But there's also a ton of um, opportunity in other markets where your creative imagination um, can really help develop this market to situate for a lot longer and have a larger stakehold in, as a media technology in general. So what would be some of the verticals that we should be looking at? Yeah, so I think, you know, I am definitely not the creative instigator on this, what I have seen that are very interesting. Um, we're thinking about it more than just trying to sell things, right? Are there opportunities to offer experiences through this. Um, one of the projects I'll, I'm working on right now is looking at it for museums. Many times there are a lot of museums that are closed down right now. What are the opportunities for actually scanning this as a museum? Um, either as in lieu of to help promote is great, but for marketization potential for actually being able to have virtual visits to museums or special um, potential archaeological digs that no one can actually go into. What are the opportunities there from an experience standpoint that this technology can be utilized for? But I've also seen things such as detective training. You know, you would never consider this as necessarily something from that as an experience, but you could even morph that potentially into something that is, you know, you're talking about the lock-in rooms or, or, you know, escape rooms. Are there opportunities potentially to expand on that idea to create experiences with the te this technology more than just a promotional tool? And who, who, who is driving the use cases for 3D tours? You all. So certainly that's a lot of what my research has shown. You know, it's not necessarily the developers. It's not the firms. Um, you know, when I talk with firms, you know, they're commonly surprised by the creative innovation that comes into play when the photographers come out, such as sticking uh, cameras down manhole covers to really be able to track plumbing, um, you know, in different countries. So there's there's different options and things that they're not considering. So there's a lot. This is why I say it's really is a creative exercise by the photographers themselves to really bring that forward. What I find too is you might find someone that actually becomes a photographer because they were in a different industry saw a potential opportunity within that industry. And that by definition is that creative imagination, bringing in their own other mental framework 
alongside this technology to create something new in an entirely different vertical, such so, as retail. So if, if, uh, if you're a photographer, and maybe you've been drawn to this because of the technology, we tend to be a little bit geeky, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing that we've come from a different vertical that perhaps we can figure out if, as you mentioned, retail, we came from the retail space, perhaps there's subject matter expertise mashed up with this technology that we can apply that the manufacturer or developer of the camera and the platform never even imagined. Correct. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I think Think of that as a benefit versus, you know, a negative that you're not necessarily an expert in real estate. Obviously, real estate was well developed um, by multitude of different uh, camera and software providers in this space, um, but there's a lot of opportunity to bring in new insight and new thoughts from your other clients and from your own previous experiences that can drive this technology into completely new uses that, that will just continue to develop this market. So is, is, the, is the imagining the future of 3D really, I, I guess I had hoped you were going to hand us the Ten Commandments or at least three or five of them. Is it, is it really who, are, who, who, who now has a camera and what is it they imagine rather than someone else thinking what they imagine? It's really the photographer perhaps come again, coming from a different vertical or a different background or subject matter expertise, mashing that up with the technology to explore a use case that may never have been considered um, by the developers. That is certainly part of it. You know, as far as uh, I don't have 10 commandments, but I do have ideas on other areas where this is going to develop. You know, there's a, there's some positive, um, really strength that I see in this continual propelling that's happening right now, right? We saw a significant increase in usage of this technology over the last year. So we're going to likely see because of the diffusion that you'll continue to help facilitate opportunities for the technology to be legitimized uh, for firms that are leading the development in this to potentially become data experts because of this large data moat, if you will, right, of this big data, of new spatial data. Um, but externally, there's a lot of opportunity. So we think about convenience in what you would consider a content life cycle. So utilizing the same content for a multitude of different ways is something I know that I'm seeing a lot of convergence and thought on in relation to this. And this is because, of course, within the larger Silicon Valley technology forward firms, this is the way we're thinking about how we can utilize this type of data. It does provide a lot of convenience, certainly for others in larger markets. So if we're thinking real estate, of course, you've got to think larger than real estate. You can utilize potentially that same technology, that same scan can be transferred to different owners over time, right? So you can utilize it for construction and utilizing it for, for uh, maybe a mortgage, um, utilizing it to potentially have some insurance guidance as well as even um, selling a couch, um, as one of my uh, informants told me as well. So that content life cycle can push some of the future of where this technology goes. But of course, there are tensions. I'm sure that's where you're, you're heading as well. Well, no, and I, I, I actually, you mentioned data mode, and I wanted to return to that. What, what do you mean by data mode? How important is data? What is the use for the data? And maybe there's photographers that are capturing data without even realizing they're capturing the data. So what, what is, what's, what's the value of the data? And what do you mean by data mode? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, and a lot of times, um, and, and I'm probably speaking to the choir here a little bit, but many times you're forced to, as a photographer, um, utilize SaaS-based uh, platforms where you put the content or the, the files onto that platform in order for you to even be able to view or use that content, right? It, it means nothing unless it's put into that platform. 
what emerges, especially in these platforms that are um, artificially intelligence uh, driven, is there is a lot of data on that back end file. So you've got, of course, the content, the pretty visual that we're all more worried about, right? As photographers, you're kind of concerned about your maybe creative rights, first of all, that's attention. So you're worried about your creative rights of who owns that, but also there's a, a load of underlying data that sits underneath the content itself. That data is measurement data, as we're aware, right? And much of many of these different types of technologies, there's ability to measure things. There's also abilities to um, identify brands of different, say, appliances. All of that information can be backlogged. Now, that is data in a similar sense that you would think of Google, of tracing data, of search data, in the same sense of Facebook, of understanding associated friends, of us as understanding associated groups. All of that data could be utilized. I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying it can be utilized in different ways potentially to create let's say optimized targeting campaigns. Let's say, um, again, being able to utilize it for insurance purposes so they know exactly what that square footage is. Um, all of that type of underlying data exists under those files. And at this point aren't necessarily, um, are being continually growing over time. That creates what you consider a data moat that kind of separates you even from maybe main competitors the more scans you have, the larger data moat you have that allows you to really be able to own this space. Spatial data isn't something that's new. That's fairly new, let's say, within the last five years that we're thinking about, you know, the being able to potentially target somebody for, hey, I see what size your living room is. Let's give you a 72 inch couch uh, when we're targeting you versus the 86 inch couch as, as an example. Do you think we'll see that? It's a possibility. I think there is, um, right now we're seeing a lot happen, right? With our big tech firms, there's a lot um, of concerns about privacy. There could be some tensions that slow that type of progression. There's a lot of open questions that need to be really discussed as a market in this area of understanding who owns that type of data. Um, that's really what my research, I hope, is at least lifting up some of those questions to start posing. Is it the homeowner? Is it the photographer? Is it the real estate agent? Is it the tech firm? There are so many different, what I would consider actors within this network that this impacts, which is why I say it's important to understand the whole trail and understanding who really has ownership of even that underlying data and what's done with that data. I, I, I so much want to visit on this topic of data, underlying data and the ownership but before I ask you about that, I, I still wanted to go back to some of the use cases. Um, you, you mentioned just in quickly passing one of the use, use cases for this the scan data collected when creating a 3D tour with some platforms uh, might be related to mortgage. What, what do you mean by that? Can you give me an example so I could get my head around that? Yeah, so it could actually, if, if we were to really think forward about where a mortgage company, what they're concerned about, there is certainly some market values when we're thinking about real estate in particular, about what the structure is, what the space actually looks like. There could be new forms of evaluation. I've actually had some informal conversations at, say, a Young Realtors Association, I won't name the city, um, but happened to meet with informally a number of people, including mortgage. Um, and they were really excited about this type of technology. They're thinking forward as far as like, what are the ways that we evaluate um, a space and making sure that we have a better understanding of the market value potential of different real estate spots? Well, for, for mortgage, does this mean I apply for a mortgage and with that mortgage application goes my 3D tour and my underlying data for the purpose of deciding that I get a mortgage sooner or I don't get a mortgage or that there really is a house here uh, and it's got walls and it's got 
X number of bedrooms and bathrooms and built out living space? Is, is, is that part of this? Potentially, right? So especially towards the end when you were mentioning a real home, understanding what is actually in the home and having that validation, you don't necessarily need the additional records. It reduces some of that paperwork that might have to go if that data is packaged in a way that is a, at benefit for mortgage companies. For so I'm, uh, I'm not a subject matter expert on mortgages, but I imagine somebody comes out to the house just to verify that there actually is a house at that property. I imagine today a satellite image could do that, but somebody still comes into the house in order to measure square footage, bedrooms, et cetera. So is, is it possible that that step could potentially be eliminated completely? Yeah, that's, that's exactly where they're thinking, especially in thinking of um, potentially reducing uh, inspections. Um, you're thinking about, you know, the, the market value. It's really what they're work most concerned about in mortgage, um, from my understanding as well, from a couple of home purchases and sales. Um, that certainly, that step could be reduced. So you've been seeing that a little bit more in recent years anyhow. And this actually provides, this type of technology provides a significant amount of transparency that images alone and video alone doesn't do. Any stage in that real estate process or in a living in a home process that requires that additional person to come in physically to a home, it will potentially reduce that necessity. So part of imagining the future for 3D perhaps is imagining a lot of data being collected. Is there at some point that you get to a tipping point that there is actually enough data for an application such as automating what I would think of as an SDK, APIs, automating the process of, oh, okay, there's a mortgage application from... Uh, 3423 Piedmont Road, Atlanta. We now need to go uh, check to see if there is a 3D model of that location. Uh, oh, okay. Now we can either do a, gee, I wonder, maybe I'm not thinking far enough in the future because I'm thinking, oh, I could walk through the 3D tour and count bedrooms. But I'm guessing you might say, well, actually the artificial intelligence, the machine learning could probably count the number of bedrooms and bathrooms and et cetera. Exactly, exactly. I mean, that would be the beauty of the underlying data. You don't necessarily need the scan, but you have the, the underlying, what you'd consider more that metadata um, that exists for each of the scans. And of course would probably need to be updated. It depends on if this becomes a technology where this is a dependency on insurance, right? If this is a, as I could, for C, so for example, um, a, an industry such as insurance driving this technology significantly forward. If there could be an evaluation that says, well, if we have a log of this, then maybe you get a break in your insurance cost. That would drive additional usage substantially um, because it gives a lot of transparency, documentation of a home. It can be updated a certain every few years. That type of uh, use case would probably drive that type of database, probably even even faster than the sell of real estate. Hmm. So when you when you think about imagining the future, uh, and then you see new technologies come along that overlay. So uh, I can think of just even in the the last few years, uh, we now see augmented reality of real spaces, uh, virtual reality of real spaces. Uh, is, is that part of what you're looking at is, is mashups of yet other technologies that enhance the value of either the tour itself or the underlying data? Yeah, that's a great question. I haven't gotten into that very far. We're starting to do that with some of our museum research with virtual, true virtual reality, um, seeing, you know, the presence that people have inside of those spaces comparative to real life experiences. Um, but that is something I'm just starting to brush upon. There's a lot of opportunity, certainly with this type of research. There's also some ethical implications we have to keep in mind as well when we're thinking about um, 
um, trying to sell a home if it ends up being restaged or potentially new flooring put down if there is some modification within some of these scans. Um, but beyond that, no, I haven't haven't dug too, too deep, mm -hmm. but it is a concern. Because I, I think if we're talking about museums and, you know, I could imagine the progression might have been, oh, we had a photo, we had multiple photos of a museum. Oh, we have a 360. Oh, we have 360s in different galleries. Oh, we have a 3D tour where it feels like you can walk through the gallery. Oh, we have virtual reality that feels like you can experience, which is impossible to explain to anyone unless they've actually experienced virtual reality. Oh, we have augmented reality. Now we have a way for wayfinding in the museum to actually walk to uh, what it is that you want to go see or uh, uh, holding up uh, perhaps an iPhone with augmented reality where I'm just holding it up towards a painting and all of a sudden the artist or the gallery curator is telling me about that artwork. Is this like, like is this the kind of things that you, you look at when you start thinking about imagining the future of all these mashups? I do see mashups as being the likely future on many of these, you know, virtual reality on its own is clunky. Um, 3D tour, you know, it tends to make people nauseous. Uh, you know, there's a lot that has to happen on the technology side. I know um, researchers across the globe that are working on that to make those, those goggles lighter weight to make it, you know, more user friendly. Um, augmented reality is great, but there's limitations within that too. So there's going to be a mixed need. You know, I see, um, extended reality going into more of a mixed effect into that mashed effect where we're utilizing uh, more uh, relatable to your point, the underlying data facilitates this, but being able to utilize the data in different ways than we're probably even considering right now of mashing that data together for, for engaging experiences for consumers. That's, that's ultimately where I can see this going. Well, uh, I'm, I'm actually old enough to remember a bag phone uh, that my parents had. I didn't have it. And I, I think if we had looked at a mobile phone, I don't even know if a bag phone, I, literally for, for someone that hadn't experienced this, it, you know, it might be uh, three inches by six inches by 10 inches. And it literally was a bag that you put over your shoulder and you'd carry it. And I think if anybody said, well, that's mobile technology, that'll never be mass adoption. So if we kind of fast forward and look at mobile phones today, it's way different than what might have been at the early beginning. Are we still at the early beginning of 3D tours, virtual reality, augmented reality? Uh, and mashups. And so it's really a little bit hard to evaluate what the future will look like because we're constrained by thinking about the future as it exists today. Yeah, I think that's a really great way of uh, creating some synapse there of, you know, because we are constrained in our current thinking and the way things are done, the way things are done in Silicon Valley, the way we sell things in Silicon Valley, the way that we are able to market and monetize things that does constrain where we go with this, um, you know, um, oftentimes developers create something for the purpose of creating technology. I mean, we, we all appreciate that. Okay, well, the newest phone is exciting because it has this feature, but oftentimes even something that's highly innovative ends up getting utilized in different ways because you bring somebody else in from the outside that does repurpose it. And I think that's true um, in general. So are we in the early stages? Most uh, technology um, experts probably would agree. We are definitely in the early stages just when it comes to extended reality. Uh, there's ton of opportunity and growth as the technology continues to streamline. We're probably still hitting some limitations when it comes to Moore's Law. As soon as we bounce back up with whatever new synthetic technology allows us to make technology even faster and smaller, it will continue to propel, but the future is, is kind of challenging because there are, and this is usually just in general where my 
research rolls in is you have so many different moving parts. It can be a good challenge. If we have any guidance whatsoever, it's understanding how we've conceived of things today. There's usually in general, um, as we're kind of feeling right now, which is another reason why I think we're early in this stage. If we think of media technology in early days, just in general over time, there's usually a fear factor, right? There's a lot of excitement as the same time as we're also really concerned potentially for the future of this technology. How does that impact us as a society? So we are definitely within that stage um, with this type of technology as well. But even if you look back at the early 1900s at radio, it had that very same all. So we talked about mobile phones probably very similarly. Of course, we're still concerned and talking about a lot of mobile technology, a lot of social media, of course, that's propelled the way we perceive um, those mobile technologies and utilizing mobile technologies. But even in radio, I mean, can you imagine in the early 1900s, you have a voice coming from a box and you're not really sure why that feels like it invades the space. Right, so we have a lot of space invasion concerns typically with new media in those early stages until it becomes more legitimized. When, when you went back to the uh, uh, historically looking at the early days of, and I don't know if that's Silicon Valley in particular or just new media in general, um, is there anything that you've teased out of the early days of whether that's radio or TV or internet or whatever it might be that you can apply to thinking about uh, the future of 3D tours? Yeah, I, you know, in the research that I've done, it's more understanding it as a, as a constraining factor versus something that's a predictive nature. Um, so, you know, that's another study that probably is worthwhile in, in diving into, but that's not been the concentration of my work to date. Um, but there's definitely some factors that we really understood from the Silicon Valley that paint the picture and understanding why we're where we're at right now, um, why technology tends to develop in the way that it does. And are, and are we way further along because of the fourth site of Silicon Valley or because photographers have been using the technology in innovative, innovative ways that were never even imagined by those that developed the technology? I would argue the later. Um, I think because digital, any of our digital technologies um, in general are going to be more readily adopted um, because it's easier to pick up because uh, you do have a technology followers um, that are avid photographers in this case who are interested in the newest technology that does propel the potential for this technology a little bit faster than say radio did. However, there were radio hams. I mean, we have to keep that in mind too, that really helped propel that technology back in the day as well. That role of the radio hams, just as today, the role of the, the VR photographer, 3D photographer is incredibly important in understanding and shaping the way that that technology is used and can be used um, and perceived as, uh, you know, in the future. Mm -hmm. so, you, you talked about uh, constraints. Uh, it, uh, was COVID-19, is COVID-19, uh, is the pandemic a constraint or a driver of this technology? I would call it a shaper. Um, we've definitely, there's no doubt about it. We've seen significant increases, even um, realtor.com, you know, in the real estate market, we've seen significant jumps. You know, they've um, executed some statistics related to that, but, you know, I would call it a shaper. So we think about, you know, if it was another crisis that we had come across that wasn't pandemic, that didn't necessarily need touchless, that would be a very different way of shaping the way this technology moves forward. 
what I had heard from many of the interviews, from talking with you, from following you all along in WGAN, is the way that it was utilized was obviously in cautious ways, new practices that came aboard, um, new ways of thinking outside the box so that you could keep your businesses alive during this time. Um, that certainly propelled it. I won't call it a driver though, I'll call it a shaper in understanding where this market goes. Increases, of course, for museums, increases for real estate so that we could continue that along. If it was another scenario, it could have gone and shaped a completely different way. Are, are there constraints uh, that have been in our space uh, that are still constraining the potential of 3D tour technology? Yeah, I think this goes back to that imaginary, the what I call the social imaginary, socio-technical imaginary of the Silicon Valley. So ultimately, the, the culture and the techno-culture, if you will, of the Silicon Valley really has focused, of course, on monetization, focused on the things that, um, that they believe can be monetized. If it doesn't fit within that pretty box, of course, and they don't understand how it could be utilized for monetization purposes, that will innately constrain the support that you receive. Real estate is, of course, a um, an industry that has received tons of um, support just through a number of mechanisms that I detail in my analysis, but also, of course, having the mindset coming in that this was a good technology because it can help monetize and create increased purchase prices, decreased days in the market. So that certainly will help to propel it forward. I'm, I now recognize I'm, an, of course, an actor that helps facilitate that too. Um, but, you know, ultimately things such as um, glam photography, uh, you know, that may not be perceived um, by Silicon Valley culture, uh, by more capitalistic culture as an area for this to really propel in that long-term monetization uh, mindset that we have in the Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. what, one of the constraints you, you mentioned was who owns, who owns all this stuff? Can, can you talk more about that topic? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, there, And this is where most of what I consider tensions arise. Of course, on the photographer side, the idea of loading imagery or loading those files into that SaaS-based platform poses questions of, wait, do I own the creative or does the technology firm own the creative? Then of course, additionally, any of the underlying data, do I own this data or does the firm own this data? If you ask a real estate agent, well, I own it, I paid for it. If you were to ask an end consumer, the seller of the home, the question would be, well, it's my home. Why wouldn't I have authority over what happens to that image, what happens? And of course, the sale of the transaction, then it goes back to the buyer. So there's a lot of complexity that happens there. Um, and right now, what I have heard from multiple photographers as well is there's a lot of changes that happen over time, um, sometimes for good, sometimes for confusion, that really does muddy the water in understanding and making that crystal clear. Um, you know, there's been privacy act. Clarity on that topic of who, who, who owns the, uh, the imagery and the underlying data. Say that again. Could you please provide clarity? of who owns the photography and who un owns the underlying data. You would really have to read the terms and conditions statements for each of the providers that you work with. I, I can't give, I won't give that, I'm not a legal <laughs> counsel. Um, yeah, but there is, I mean, and it's something yes, I- it's not, it's not fair for me to ask you that question. It's almost re 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 rhetorical. Uh, and it, it, it is interesting to hear you identify potential different stakeholders from the photographer to the, the technology provider to the client in, in the vertical real estate agent in that vertical of real estate, the agent being selling somebody's home. Uh, okay, well, uh, is there a location license in there? And was there permission for use beyond the intended use? Mm -hmm. And now is that 
underlying data being used for a different purpose that wasn't originally, uh, I, I doubt the homeowner even knew that there was underlying data and how would that affect the potential future homeowner of what their interest might be in that data. I probably have left out government in this because I imagine that, that there at, at some point will probably be some legislation here that affects the buyer of the house who may have different, in, who may own the house at that moment in time, and yet there's data associated with the, that house that they may or may not own. So it's, forgive me, it's not fair for me to ask you that question, I, but I feel like I should ask it, but I, I will ask about the tension. So because those there's, there's not clear answers, at least from my perspective as a photographer, who of course thinks I own everything that I shoot in the absence of somebody telling me otherwise, what does that tension do in terms of the future of 3D tour technology? Yeah, I mean, in short, it slows it down. Um, you're going to have a significant photographer start to move off because there's not that clarity. They might find other providers or completely move to different types of technology, drone and others where they feel like they have more ownership over the video. Um, you also might find from a real estate agent, I think it's clear within this market, the real estate agents, unless they're the photographer as well, um, may not have full clarity on what is provided as well. So they may not be understanding that there are those data derivatives either, um, you know, but there is some lack of clarity of ownership still within that role. What I'm most, most concerned about is that, that end property owner. So thinking about that end property owner, how many steps away are we now? And as an end consumer is now the new owner of a property, um, well, am I going to start receiving targeted marketing based on certain things? I don't think that's appropriate. I worked in way too long in uh, direct marketing, um, direct mail, email, text messages, phone calls back in the day when we used to actually call people. Um, and so, you know, we have, I can definitely see just the way the structure to your point of government and policy where we've had it in the past that that type of database is coming when that will happen i'm not sure um but i and as a consumer advocate i hope that this discussion continues yeah i i'm going to frame that with an analogy that i don't know the answer to but it is a bit frightening and i think it's related to this topic because i i know in the last month or so uh, i've had different conversations with my wife at different times. And, uh, and for example, a discussion, uh, we don't own a dog, we don't own a pet, but we were discussing pets and we were discussing pets is related to plush and robotic. And within a half hour on Facebook, I was served up an ad that was very specific to our conversation, which couldn't have been ran uh, coincidental because there, we, we, we don't have pets. We would never discuss pets. We were discussing it in context to family uh, and boom, there was an ad. And that's happened multiple times. So I think, and I don't know the answer to that. And I, hopefully somebody will get back to me and comment on that. But I think the way it's relevant is the person who has bought the home wouldn't expect, as you, as you mentioned, necessarily to be served up ads maybe for uh, carpet because uh, the, the platform can tease out that that home has 20% hardwood floors. And, and uh, so they're a candidate for carpet. Right. Whatever that appropriate marketing piece might be, uh, that that might not be the most sensitive piece of information. But may, you know, maybe I'm being served up an um, alarm. The homeowner, the homeowner is being served up. Uh, well, uh, your your house is more likely to be 
broken into be, because your ratio of windows to square footage is higher. I don't know what it might be. Mm -hmm. So the, these are real issues, aren't they? In terms of who, there, someone is gathering the data. So there are some, so I, I, you know, I think back when I bought my Matterport camera in July of 2014, Matterport was kind of sort of the only player at that time, sort of, kind of. Today, we, uh, we get around network tracks 170 plus 3D, 360 virtual tour platforms and software. Matterport was pretty much the only kind of camera of its kind at that time. And today there are 50 plus cameras uh, that, that we track in this space. So uh, I wonder about the data collection of, uh, which is a subset of those 170 of companies that do that, what is it they might do with that data? And I, I'm not sure that we'll resolve that on today's show, but I think the, the context is it, it does impact trying to imagine the future of 3D tour technology as attention. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, as far as how we imagine we can utilize it, but at the same time, simultaneously, it completely impacts the potential development as well, um, you know, and what kinds of policy may come alongside that and things we need to be conscious of. You know, as a marketer, I recall, uh, sadly, I'll date myself when, you know, do not call lists, there were new regulations. Constantly, I recall being new regulations really to that new regulations um, to direct mail we're in an early stage in this type of technology where there really isn't much beyond california has a little bit that touches this technology but beyond that um, it's not something we're talking about yet but it's going to come so it's it's something that we need to be considerate of and from an ethical standpoint and and becoming ethical business owners um, it's important for us to to make and expose and understand um, what people are comfortable with um, and what, you know, making recommendations as real estate agents. Yeah, you might want to put down those family photos, you know, maybe scanning with those family photos isn't the right idea. Um, understanding even those minor practices that usually we're fine with that maybe we need to consider that because this has a longer shelf life. But it is a good question about someone that has a semantic understanding of the house knows how many windows, knows which way the windows face, how many doors there are, what appliances that are in the house, what's the floor covering. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of data that uh, at scale certainly becomes interesting from if you're the company that owns or, or let's see how to say, has the data. Yeah. But I'm not, it's a good question about ownership, but, but has the data and wants to license the data for uh, use cases and how that, uh, ne never mind whether the photographer feels like they should get a piece of that action or the ethical issues, I'm still thinking about the, the, the buyer of the house and there is a lot of data that's been collected that they might think should not be public and accessible. Anyway, yeah. so, so we, we should probably just call that attention. And that's something that's affecting the potential for imagining the future of 3D. Are there, are there other tensions in the space yeah, as I mentioned before, the, you know, we concentrated predominantly on consumer privacy, but the biggest challenges there as well as copyright and creative rights, um, you know, for, for photographers themselves. I, I still say that's going to be a large tension. Um, we've seen lawsuits already pop up for this, um, so that's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, beyond that, it's being able to utilize and having limited imagination, and that can happen. So one of the concerns when we're thinking about Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is no longer a place, right? So Silicon Valley has now become a globalized phenomenon. Um, I'm about to move to Silicon Valley Harbor is uh, Charleston, you know? So there's every Silicon Valley Hills I used to live in, um, in Austin, Texas. 
everyone wants a little bit of Silicon Valley. That mindset has proliferated uh, globally. So if that continues to proliferate, that will limit our potential scope and how this technology can be utilized. So I advocate obviously for taking a stroll, thinking about things differently when it comes to technology so that we don't get boxed in and limited based on the the constraints that might happen from that type of mindset. When, when you talk about imagination, I, I, uh, having read some of your um, uh, documents on this topic, you, you have some different ways of thinking about imagination. Um, I, I think it would probably be helpful in terms of, um, there's different ways of looking at imagination. Isn't that interesting? So can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, at a high level, um, Imagination is definitely a, a concept that has belonged to a lot of different streams of interest. Um, it's definitely more of a philosophical type of approach, which makes it fun. It also meant that my research went in a very different direction than I would have anticipated coming into this program. But imagination in general has always been perceived as, well, it's something that happens because we experienced it in the past. So things that we maybe were related to our senses, things that we could see, smell, touch, hear, taste, and our imagination was potentially limited to that. But many people disagree with that as well. And they say, you know, we're humans. Human imagination is not limited to just the things that we've experienced in the past. So the way that I conceptualize imagination, um, I've got three different forms that I talk about, but one, of course, the ability to think about things paired together in unique ways based on our past experiences. That's considered creative imagination. I, I borrow these terms from philosophers, they're not mine, my own, um, but creative imagination is, is what many photographers do. They're using the technology in a totally different way and they're mashing it together versus say a developer who might perceive the world completely different than what they see today. By doing that and enlivening that um, new innovation, that's what you would consider more of a recreative imagination. Very confusing terminology, but a recreative, they're recreating the world potentially around them versus what we kind of were brushing against, which is this idea of the imaginary. And we have to understand that these creative and even recreative types of things and imagination that we have in our heads exists within a larger structure of a social imaginary and in the result of like say technology oriented imaginary, a socio-technical imaginary. And that's, a, I dare you to say that five times fast, but the socio-technical imaginary ultimately is interested in progressing science and progressing technology in a way that benefits those. Um, so that comes with good and bad, of course, that, that emerge, which certainly emerges here as well in this, uh, as we're seeing as we talk through tensions. But that imaginary even helps to guide some of these creative and those recreative imagination um, processes. When I try to imagine the future in our space, the, the things that I think about, and maybe I'm just way too simplest, too, too simplistic about it, but I think, well, the quality of the gear, the capture, the photography is getting better. Every, every month, year, it's progressive. It progresses. And I wonder, wow, what might that do for imagining the future? The price keeps coming down. Mm -hmm. uh, as things get better, things get either at least less expensive or there's more that you can do for the same amount of money. Am I thinking too small when I think about just, oh, the quality is getting better, the price is coming down, there's going to be exciting things coming that we haven't even imagined yet. It's not atypical, right? So what I find what's interesting and what really drove me down this path of trying to understand, now, wait a second, what's happening? Because there's these buckets of individuals that think somewhat similarly, they're still guided by, you know, things that you would see in typical capitalistic markets, typical Silicon Valley, um, technology centered, it's going to be more convenience, it's going to be more utilitarian, it's going to be, you know, that's pretty common for people who are more tech 
technology centered. If you speak to a real estate agent, it might be slightly different. What their imagination is constrained to when they're thinking the future is, is stuff that also is related to real estate. So uh, virtual staging and, you know, it's any, uh, and as well as hardware that allows you to feel the space potentially further down, but there's no mindset beyond that. You talk to somebody who's done something like a number of different types of scans that you can tell that the mindset and the evaluation for potential futures starts to widen. Um, but ultimately I continued to hear from individuals, a lot of technology oriented mindset, as well as potential use cases that were still limited to the real estate with us uh, sprinkling, because that's pretty similar to what we're seeing in this market right now, predominantly real estate and technology gurus with a little bit more of individuals that have other experience that are thinking about, oh, well, if I have a theater background, if I have a theater background, I might think of actually doing, utilizing this in a different way that relates to also theater, not just real estate. Mm -hmm. well, well, when I do think about quality getting better, price coming down, that kind of the, the next you know, two things that I start to think about is, oh, this data that's being collected. Uh, and, and certainly in the first year or two, the, I know I was collecting data. There wasn't anyone that had any interest in it, at least on, on my radar, but I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this data, the semantic understanding of a space, wow, if this scales, it's some humongous data set that can be served up with an API, well, that sounds like it really could have an impact on the future of 3D tours. Yep, absolutely. They, not just 3D tours, but then as we discussed a lot of other things related to real estate, but even further than that. Yeah, so the, in, 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 in many verticals, uh, so uh, I suspect we still, we haven't even, we don't know what we don't know. We know that, that this data, the spatial data is interesting, but maybe the use case of that data is by someone who's not even in our ecosystem that looks at the data and says, wow, you, can, you collect that kind of data? Well, I'm in this field. This is how I would use that data. So yeah. we, we may not have even, uh, found the people who know how to unlock the value, the data. I mean, yeah. So we talked about mortgages, but okay. But is there a mortgage company that's, that's actually like deep in the, in the, in the, into, yeah, let's accelerate that. Or the, you know, I, I think about insurance documentation, I, you know, it's a little crazy thing. We've had three different floods in the house, all, for different reasons and everybody comes out, the insurance adjuster comes out and creates an exactimate, the general contractor comes out and makes an exactimate and the key subcontractor comes out, makes an exactimate and then another insurance adjuster comes out for some reason and I'm thinking, well, who's paying for this bill? Doesn't the insurance company care that they're being charged by all these different people to create the same? And isn't that what Matterport does is it, it captures all the data and could create the tour once. So, you know, I, I wonder at what point did some companies, you know, finally come into this space and, and say, this is so disruptive in a good way, and that it will, it will save a lot of money uh, for the stakeholders, and will also save a ton of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, even as I say that, maybe I'm, I'm a constraint, because I'm, I, I only think in terms of things that, that make money and save time. Uh, so, it, it, and, and, and maybe that th those aren't the right filters or the only filters for imagining yeah, the future. It's, 
interesting because that actually taps into some of my other work within the real estate is it's really common, especially in technology and those that are more technology oriented to consider a technology is highly what you'd consider utilitarian. So convenience and less costly and, and those mechanisms, as we see right away, that's got to be the inherent value that comes from this technology. When in fact, this technology also builds emotion, there ends up being a lot of what we would call hedonic. So things that are more emotional, things that actually bring um, social presence to being able to share this with uh, loved ones, uh, you know, across of three states away, um, these types of values, even an ethical value, we talked about ethics a lot, but there is inherently, you know, there's some ethical value that gets encapsulated with this type of technology. My, my business card says, about. my business card says chief photographer. It sounds like I need to change that to chief, chief hedonics officer, or chief <laughs> privacy officer, chief security officer. There's a lot of other hats that I haven't thought about that I actually need to, to, to wear when I'm capturing this data because it, it does have tons of other use cases known and what we think are probably, is, it, is this like an iceberg where we only see the tip of the iceberg of the future because that's the constraint of how we see the world. We see it in, the, in our own little world of, of residential real estate, maybe commercial real estate, may, maybe insurance documentation, but really that, that's only the tip of the iceberg of what's possible. Yeah, and I would also say we're probably looking at it from slightly different angles on top of that, right? Because we all have different clusters of our social upbringing and how, you know, how we live that might, I'm seeing it from this angle, you're seeing it from this angle, a consumer seeing it from that angle because they just want the technology to integrate with everything else so it makes their lives easier. But then there are all of these things, to your point, under the surface, we're not considering, we're not thinking about because we always associate technology with that utilitarian because it is by definition, technology is a tool. Um, and when we think of tools, we think utility, but ultimately it has so much more embedded within it. Hmm. This is awesome. I know we started out, the, the, with my first question was, what is the future of 3D tour technology for real estate photographers? I'm not sure that we've answered that question. Um, it might be that we've generated more questions than answers, but maybe that's really important that we all start thinking about what the future is. I, and I know I can't wait for the future to arrive, whatever that is. Uh, Kelly, um, uh, uh, what, what's your next project? What, what other research are you working on? So we're continuing to work on MLS data, of course. We just got a 2020 data set. So we're trying to look at pre and during um, the pandemic, trying to understand what that did, at least in a single market, um, working with a phenomenal, uh, my phenomenal co-authors, another one we picked up who does some amazing um, econ econometric stuff that that's not my expertise. So I'm so stoked to have her, Julia, uh, Julia on the project now to help out with that. And then um, another one that I mentioned earlier, we're still working toward museums and trying to understand the 3D tours. And hopefully soon when things are safe to start collecting data in person, we'll do some virtual reality and really understanding these how that evaluation of space, understanding what we gain from that type of experience, and also what is it that we're losing? You know, that thing under the bubble we're not even thinking about losing in that experience um, that's underwater, but I, I suspect there are some things that we're probably losing in that experience that are important to understand when utilizing this for specifically museums, but also other types of use cases as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for researching the space and adding insight to understanding what we do. I know most of us as photographers were thinking about today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. So having a conversation about imagining the future of 3D tour technology or, or what is it that we can learn, tease out of the MLS data to help us all uh, succeed faster uh, is, is awesome. Thank you for being on the show again, Kelly. Thank you, Dan, really appreciate it. Uh, we've been visiting with Dr. Kelly Coors Anderson, uh, a researcher at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, uh, 
Uh, Dr. Anderson is also an incoming assistant professor of marketing at the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina, and that's effective August 2021. Uh, I'm Dan Smegrad, founder of the We Get Around Network Forum for Kelly in Lubbock and myself in Atlanta. Uh, thanks for tuning in to WGAN-TV Live.